Welcome to Live Doff, your online Doff Yomi Shear. Shalom Aleichem and welcome back. Today's Daf is Ksubay's Samach Vav. We are holding on Samach Zayim, Samach Heim, two lines from the bottom. So what happens if an Isha, a married woman, finds a Metzio? She finds an item. Who keeps it? Herself or her husband? We discussed it a bit yesterday and today the Gemara will elaborate further on this topic. Two lines from the bottom. Tone Tano, Kamei de Rava. A Chacham presented the following Brisa to Rava. The Brisa says, Metzia Saisha La'atzma. A woman's finding goes to herself, she keeps it, and not her husband. That is the opinion of Tano Kama. Rabbi Kiro Emer Labala. No, it goes to the husband. That was the Brisa. Omar Le said, Rava responds to the Chacham who presented this price. How can you say that Rebbe Kiva would take the Metzia and grant it to the husband? Hashta. Now, take a look. Uma Ha'adafa. Even when we speak about extra earnings that she produces, above the standard required earnings that an Isha is meant to provide to her husband, Ha'adaf is the extra earnings. We had a shear of five sela, ten sela, which we discussed the other day. So if she's going beyond that, the extra earnings, that's called Ha'adaf. The Masayadahi. Technically, it's part of her earnings, which really should go to the husband in exchange for the Mizoyas that he provides her with, right? Still, what does Rabbi Kiva say? Um, Rabbi Kiva la'atzma. We will see in a minute that Rabbi Kiva holds that extra earnings is not entitled to the extra earnings. It goes to her. She keeps it. La'atzma. Even though we're speaking about earnings which typically go to the husband. Mitzi Yasa Koshkin. Of course, when we speak about findings, which has nothing to do with her husband, why wouldn't she just keep that? Why would you maintain that according to Rabbi Kiva, her husband keeps it? That seems incorrect and inconsistent with Rabbi Kiva. The Snanavs, we find Rabbi Kiva in the following Mishnah. She gets up and declares, Whatever I produce will be a Kainam. It's a nickname for Karban. It should be Aser through a, a Neder. To your mouth. Meaning you can't consume anything that I produce. You can't have any benefit from my earnings. The husband has no worries whatsoever. He doesn't have to interfere with the nether because she's meshubat him. She's committed to bringing in these earnings. It's not hers to make us, right? Tanakama maintains this applies to regular standard earnings or even the extra earnings. Both are considered his. Rabbi Kiva Omer Yafir. Husband should get involved and nullify the nether. You know why? Standard earnings belong to him. She can't make it usher. But, She might actually earn a bit extra, more than what he deserves. In which case, that extra is hers. And her nether can be chal, can be applied to that extra. So to circumvent that problem, he should make a foras in the derm, remove the nether entirely. Clearly, Rabbi Kiva holds that the extra earnings, the Ha'adofa, she keeps. Even though it's really technically something that she earns and earnings are typically his, Ha'adofa is a, a different thing, a different category. Certainly a Ha'amatsiya, something that she finds on the street, why would her husband be entitled to it? Ella Eifach, rather, the correct version would be to reverse the shittas. Metziah Seisha Labal, Tanakama maintains, what she finds goes to the husband. Uh, just like the Tanakama says, that the extra earnings go to the husband. Chacham will masakin everything to the husband, we want to keep uh, peace and harmony in the home. Whatever she makes goes to the husband. Rabbi Kiva Oimer La'atzma. The Metziah, she keeps. Just like the Ha'adafa is hers. Asks the Gemara, what do you mean? Vaki also Ravan. When Rabbi came from Eitz Yisrael, he had the following message. Omar Rabbi Yechanan. He quotes Rabbi Yechanan. If the extra earnings 
happened to come easily, without much exertion or effort on her part. She was a you know, talented person, and she earned extra money. In that case, Kuli Amuli Pligi all agree. There is no disagreement whatsoever. The Baal Habi belongs to the husband. It's part and parcel of the earnings. So he happens to be lucky that she's a good earner, and she's earning extra above the standard, you know, uh, uh, standard amount. Husband gets that. All agree. Husband gets that. Keep pligi. When do we have this machlekes? When does Rabbi Kiva say that she keeps her extra earnings? That's when she made an extra effort to earn that earning. Ba'adofa, the extra earning, which came about through extra exertion and effort. That's the question. Who gets that? Tanakama sarva labal. Tanakama maintains, well, earnings are earnings, all to the husband. We don't differentiate. Rabbi Kiva sarva la'atzma. Rabbi Kiva holds, well, you made that extra effort, you deserve to keep that extra. And the Gemara figures at this point. Something which she finds walking down the street is something just, by the way, circumstantial. Something which does not require, does not entail effort or exertion. In which case, who should keep it? The husband should keep it. So why would Rabbi Kiva say that she keeps it? Rav Papa, let's fix that up. That's incorrect. Mitzia is synonymous to extra earnings which come about through exertion and effort. And Rashi says typically you find you know, fish at the river bank and you have to look for a treasure. It's something which requires effort. And therefore, it is a plukt to Rabbi Kiva Rabbanon. It ends up being a machlaikis. Between Rabbi Kiva who says, well, you put in the effort, you deserve it. And Rabbanon say, no, we don't differentiate, send it all to the husband. So bottom line is, Regular earnings, Masio Daim, goes to the husband in exchange for the Mazainas that he provides her with. Extra earnings, Ha'adafa, well, it depends. If they come easily, then it goes to the husband as well. No Machlekes. But if it's Aidea Tchak, through exertion and effort, in that case, Rabbi Kiva maintains she keeps it. And Metzia has the same halacha as Ha'adafa, Sha'idea Tchak. Now, how do we define? How do we define the chak? Exertion and effort. Suppose she's extra talented and she accomplishes two tasks at once. She does two malachis in one shot. Mahu. Who keeps that extra earning? Who keeps that extra money? Is that just called natural earnings? Or is that by way of exertion? Suppose Two jobs at once is considered uh, regular earnings. What about three or four jobs at once? Rashi says she could perform four tasks simultaneously. While she's spinning the, you know, the uh, flax, she's also keeping an eye on the vegetables and she's uh, giving music instructions and sitting on some eggs there to, uh, to have them hatch. She can do four tasks at once. Mahu, how do we define this? Is this conventional? Take it, we let it stand. Baish to come back to the mission. So this fellow embarrassed his wife. A stranger embarrassed, you know, Ruvain's wife. Mishnah says, any embarrassment or, you know, bodily damage that this fellow will pay, part of it would go to the, uh, to his victim, to the Isha, and part of it to her husband, according to uh, Rabbi Yehuda ben Masira. Asks the Gemara, why does Mr. Husband deserve anything? His wife was a victim and he gets paid. Based on this, let's say, Ruben shamed Shimon's horse. Does he have to pay the boishas to the owner? Ask us more one sec. Since when the, is the horse going to get embarrassed? Ella, rather, I'll give you another analogy. Rokak be Suppose Ruben spits on Shimon's garment. Do you mean to say that he'll have to pay Boishas to um, the owner of that beged? Well, of course not. So why would this be different? Why would the husband be entitled to payment upon his wife's embarrassment? 
He wasn't embarrassed. His wife got embarrassed. Oh, so perhaps, actually, you do pay for spitting at the other person's begged. But none. The mission tells us otherwise. Rokak, he spits at the other fellow. And the spit actually reached him personally. Hit his body. Another example. He uncovers a married woman's hair. Or he walks over to his friend, pulls off his garment. In all these cases, he must pay up 400 zuz for the shame and embarrassment that he brought about. Papa, Papa explained, When he spits, he has to pay because he hit the person himself. He only struck his baguette with his spit. It's not... Uh, it's not comfortable, but it's not considered a severe uh, busha, and therefore there's no chiv of payment here. So why would he have to pay the owner, the, the husband, upon his wife's embarrassment? Why is it different than the beggar? A- answers the Gemara, big difference, but big deal, Leslie Zalusa. Sure, a person spits on my beggar, big deal. doesn't really uh, affect me much. I have no uh, embarrassment from that. A person embarrasses my wife. I'm shamed. I'm embarrassed. She's mine. She identifies with me. Husband and wife are synonymous with each other and when she's embarrassed, he's embarrassed. And therefore, he's deserving of some payment. Okay, I'll draw another analogy. If that's the case, listen to this. You have a poor fellow who is a member of an upstanding uh, family. Right? And now they're meant to look after him, uh, protect him from everything, right? And somebody embarrasses this uh, wretched fellow. An Ani who was a Ben Toivim, a member of an upstanding family. This was a Lusa Lekulu, in which case he causes, he brings about shame and embarrassment to the entire family for not looking after him properly. In this case as well, he has to pay them damages. The boy Lumit and the the call Bnei has to pay the entire family. They can sue him for emotional damage, for embarrassment. Of course not. Uh, you know, just because they, you know, they suffer emotional distress from this uh, incident, it's a residual. It's a, it's a, it's a by the way type of effect. It's not. He didn't directly embarrass them. So why would this husband be entitled to receive payment upon his wife's embarrassing experience? That's the cash. Amar <laughs> Lay, Ravashi responds. You can't compare. Awesome, love, go fire. You see, in the case of the Oni Ben Toivim, he didn't strike the, the goof, he didn't directly damage or embarrass the other family members. But a wife, a wife and a husband are one. When you embarrass my wife, you've embarrassed me. I'm suffering personally. It's a personal experience. And therefore, he's deserving of some pain. So a father commits to giving a large dowry upon his daughter's marriage. Chasnay for his uh, son-in-law. Umeis Chasnay suddenly tragedy strikes, his son-in-law passes away. And now the daughter is transferred to the brother. Right, The son-in-law's name was Reuven. She's now transferred to Shimon, who's going to do Yibum. So the father of the uh, Kala can turn to the Yavam and say, Look, Mr. Shimon, I have news for you. No dowry. I was glad to give this dowry to your brother, Reuben, but he's no longer here. I'm interested in giving you a penny. You can do that. I didn't commit to giving it to Shimon. I committed to give it to Reuben. Continues the Mishnah on the topic of dowries. So she commits to bringing in a thousand dinar in terms of her dowry, right? Which she will take, uh, her husband will take and and use and, and profit from. How much will he actually write into the ksuba? What amount will he write into the ksuba? He will add 50%. Who plays the kinegdom? The amount that he writes for this uh, Dowry is Chamesh Esrei Mon. He records as though he received 1.5 times what he actually got. 15 manas. So a man is 100 dinar. She actually brought him 1,000 dinar, which is really 10 mana. 
Instead of writing 10, he writes 15, 1.5. Why? And that was the accepted minic. Because he can profit from it. Do some business with it, gain from it. So it's only fair that he he actually commits to 1.5 that amount. So let's say uh, there's divorce, he will pay her 1,500 dinar. Ask the Rishonim, Rebus! One is allowed to pay back more than he, t- than he took. Answer the Rishonim, it's not Rebus. I can take a dollar today and commit to giving you back two dollars a minute later. Ribis, you see, Ribis is like a usage fee. You allow me usage for, uh, for a month, I will pay you back more than what you gave me. But let's say I promise to give you back a dollar fifty the next second. That's not a usage fee, that's just an agreement that we have. You give me one, I'll give you back two. <laughs> so since he's committing immediately to give her back 1.5%, Sorry, 1.5 times the amount that she gave him. So even if she divorces right away, he must pay her back that inflated amount. That is not Rivas. That's a commitment. That's an agreement that we have. You give me, I give you back more. It so happens to be that he had it for 10 years and then divorced. But technically, he would have paid her the same 1,500 zoos had he divorced right away. He accepted upon himself an inflated commitment. That's not Rivas. Interesting twist there. So when it comes to actual uh, cash, actual money, she brings him 100, he commits to 150. So 50% more. Oh, let's say she's bringing merchandise, things which are appraised. Begadim, various objects. These are things that are called shum. So there they would, they would inflate it. So that it looks more grand and adds to the celebration and endears her to her husband, they would sort of inflate the value of the items that she brings in. That was the derech, that was the accepted practice. So when it comes to cash, he's meant to inflate it because he gains from it, he profits from the actual money. Here we have the flip side. When they actual, actually appraise items, they inflate it. Unfairly. <laughs> so then, he has the right to sort of deduct when he actually puts it into the Ksuba, he writes into the Ksuba, you know, I, I am being macabre, I'm committing to this and this much value as per the items that she brought in. Ukenegad Hashum, how he do it? He deducts 20%. She deducts a fifth. So they would take a car which was worth $80 and pretend it was worth 100 They would say, hey, Mr. Hassan, look, you have something that's worth 100 but really they knew it's worth only 80 so in the Ksuba, he only writes 80. But let's say Shum Bimana, he's been asked to commit in writing that he's accepting upon himself the value of this item as, as it's worth a mana, right? Vishava mana. It so happens that the, the mana value is the actual market value of this item. Nobody inflated it. So in the of course, he only gets a mana. He's not entitled to more. The whole point of downgrading, of deducting 20% as if it was overinflated, fine. So then, uh, he's got to reckon accordingly. But here, the money that he's committing to is the actual value of the item. Shum money, but typically where we do inflate the value. So if he's committing, in writing, to accept upon himself the achrais of a money, I uh, got this and this item, which is worth a money. He's writing that in the star. So how much does it have to be worth? It has to be worth a mana. But since they inflate its value by 20%, so in terms of the of how they view it, of how they appraise it, they have to appraise it for more. In which case then it would be worth really a mana. They have to appraise it for, it had to have been appraised for 120, 125, right? a fifth more. So if he's going to actually commit to a mana in the ksuba, shum be mana, he no isenes, shloishim be echad tzela vedina. Then she must actually bring him something, which was appraised amongst the you know the people at the chupa, for how much? Thirty-one sela. A sela is four is four dinar. So thirty-one times four is one hundred twenty-four vedina. And another dinar, one hundred twenty-five. So if they appraise it at one twenty-five, its real value is a hundred, and that corresponds to the amount that he committed in the ksuba.
Another example is If the husband is committing to 400, he's writing it, you know, to the Ksuba, he accepted upon himself the Shuma, uh, you know, item which was valued at 400. So it must be appraised by the uh, celebrants at 500. In which case its real value is really 400. As we conclude, when the Chasan commits in the, in the Ksuba, it's by way of deduction. A, a, a fifth deduction, a 20% deduction from the appraised value amongst the celebrants. Tanarabano. Go back to the beginning of the Mishnah. The husband um, receives this promise from the father in law, such and such dowry. The husband passes away, and now she is slated for Yibam by the husband's brother, by Shimon. Her father can say, Look, I had no intention of giving it to you. Tanarabano. Ain't Sarah Lema. goes without saying. If the first husband, Reuven, Rishim was a Talmud Chach. So we understand why the, uh, her father wanted to support him. Vishen Yamaretz, but the brother, who's the Yavam, is just an Amaretz. Of course, in that case, her father can refuse to follow through with his uh, dowry. Ela filu Rishon Amaretz. But even if the situation is reversed, Reuven was a, an Amaretz, and still he was promised all that money. Vishen Yamaretz, and the brother, Shimon, the Yavam is... A Talmud Chacham. Even in that case, Yochel Leimar, her father can say, Lo chicha hayisi roitze liten. I decided to give this money to Reuben, your brother. Lecha i'efshi liten. I'm uninterested in you. Uninterested in giving you any money. He has a right to say that. I never committed to Shimon, only to Reuben. Now, if we take a look at the Mishnah, we'll find some apparent redundancies. We have two concepts in the Mishnah, in terms of appraisals. when she's actually bringing in liquid assets, cash, he's willing to go up 50% to account for the profits that he's going to make from it. Okay, that's number one. Then we discuss the appraisals. We downgrade everything by 20% because they usually inflate it. For the uh, Simchas Chas and Makal, they inflate things. Something really worth 100, they decide it's worth 125. So bottom line is his commitment needs only be for 100. But the Mishnah cites several examples, several variations of this same concept. The question is, why the redundancy? Why the repetition? So, she's bringing in... Uh, he's going to deduct Chaimish. Uh, and then it says, um, you know... He commits to 100, and they have to appraise it at 125. It's pretty much repeating the same idea over and over. Hainerasha. Isn't this the same as the first case? There's a slight difference between the two. Tano Shuma Rabba. First, the mission discusses this idea of inflating the appraisals and values in terms of a large dowry. Thousands. Of, perhaps, uh, you know, it's a large dowry. It makes sense to inflate it. So it looks better and looks more exciting. Uktani Shumazut. And then the Mishnah makes reference to a small size dowry. Hundreds of us. And that's also inflated. The Khidish is even small dowries are inflated as well. Alternatively, says Rashi. If we only speak about a small dowry, I would think, well, over there. They try to inflate it to avoid you know embarrassment to make it look good. And the Khidish says, no, even a large dowry has the same practice. So that's why the Mishnah discusses a large amount and a small amount to indicate in both cases we have the same 20% deduction. Likewise, Tana Shuma Didei. Tana Shuma Dida. You see, at the last line of the Mishnah, we have Masha Chosen Paisik, right? The first line of the, of the Amit here. Masha Chosen Paisik, Paisik Pachos Chemish. Which is sort of a repetition that he's going to deduct 20%. Why, why go into that again? So as the Mishnah, the Mishnah says the Gemara, we have two you know, aspects of this this uh, inflated appraisal. We have Shuma Di Day and Shuma Di Da. See, sometimes they bring it into the, you know, they bring it into the wedding having been appraised already by members of her family. Shuma Di Da. So they appraise it using this inflated method. And then the last 
line of the Mishnah speaking about he's inflating it. Mashachosim Pesach, he is appraising it. And the point is that this formula of adding 20% is applicable irrespective of who's appraising it, she's appraising it, her family, he's doing it, his family. The same idea applies all around. We always deduct 20% to account for that inflated appraisal. Continues the Mishnah. Pasco lahachnas soften. So let's say she uh, decides she's bringing uh, some money into the, into the marriage. So what happens now? As we said before, he is willing to accept upon himself one and a half times the amount that she actually brought in. Silla, so her cellar, which is really for dinner, nas shisha dinner, suddenly turns into six dinner. Right? 50% gain as we explained before, because of the profit that he's anticipating from this uh, money. The Gemara will ask, uh, what's the uh, point of repeating the halacha again? We discussed it a minute ago. The Gemara will discuss. One more thing. Ha-chosan mekabal olav asura dinerim lekupa. The chosan accepted upon himself to provide his wife with ten dinar. What for? For the kupa. Kupa is... Uh, some sort of account that she will use to purchase her cosmetics. So it's ten dinar, lekol mane u mane. For every mane, mane is a hundred uh, dinar, of dowry that she brings in, she's entitled to ten dinar for this kupa, for this box or whatever of, of cosmetics. Rabon Shimon Gamlil Aymer, Akol Kibnega Medina, no, we can't set rules. In terms of the, uh, you know, the first halacha that he uh, he adds fifty percent. In terms of the second halacha, the exact amount of uh, the kupa, it's all according to the minag of that particular locale. And the question is, why does the Mishnah start with the same halacha that we have already learned in the previous Mishnah that he adds fifty percent to the cash income? Haven't we already learned in the previous Mishnah that for a thousand zuz? He commits to 1500. Answers the Gemara. Well, there's a chiddush in either mission. Tana iska rabba. First, we discuss a large deal. Tana iska zuta. Then we discuss a small deal, a cellar which turns into six dinar. And each one has its own special chiddush. Utsricha both are needed. Itana iska rabba. We only discuss a large deal. The nafish rabcha produces great profits. I would say, okay, over there he's willing to add 50%. Now, iska zuta, but if it's a small, small time deal. The Zuta Ravcha with very uh, small profits. Aimalai, perhaps in this case, is not willing to add 50%. Sricha, the Chiddush says yes. Even in this case, he does. Yashmin and Iskazuta, if we only discuss a small deal, the Zuta is a you know, would say, okay, he's willing to add 50% because the expenses are very uh, are very small when we speak about small deals. Avaliska Rabba, when it's a large deal, lots of transactions, lots of business deals, the Nafish is a you know, lots of expenses going on. Aimalai, perhaps in that case, he has a lot of uh, outlay, and he wouldn't be willing to add 50%. Sricha, the chiddush is no. In all cases, a cash income produces an f- extra 50% commitment. Hachasen mekabel olav asor adina lekupa. So he commits to giving 10 dinar for the kupa. What is kupa? My kupa, maravashi, kupa shal besamim, container of cosmetics. She's giving her such and such cosmetics per amount of dowry that she brings in. She's entitled to this much cosmetic because, look, when I bring into the marriage, this uh, arrangement of 10 dinar for the kupa per 100 is only Ella Birushalayim, who said in Yerushalayim, where they use this much cosmetics. But Ravashi, I have an interesting question. He has to give 10 dinar per 100. But remember, they used to overvalue, right? they used to inflate the, the appraisal of the, of the item that she brings in. So, are we speaking real value or appraised value? B'mona hanishem, the appraised value, which is really inflated, or b'mona miskabel, or is it per the real value which he commits himself for? That's one question. Im temtzalei b'mona miskabel. Now Rashi and, and Taisus both say the next few lines in the Gemara is very difficult to understand. It's sort of a a chain, you know, a question and answer. It's, it's one question leading to the next, which is a bit hard to tie together. Well, we'll try our best. Im temtzalei mar say that we um, we rate it based on the 
actual value that the husband commits himself to. Okay, say that's a given. Now comes the next question. How often does he give her this? Yom Rishon, is it just a one-time thing? They get married, right away he gives her the 10, uh, you know, the 10% for the cosmetics, and that's it. Use it as you wish. Or is it distributed? Is it a daily allocation? He takes uh, whatever the amount that he's going to give her eventually and sort of splits it up, you know, a bit per, per day. This way she doesn't use it up all at once. He gives her what she needs per day and then when she uses it up, you know, of course, he'll have to give her uh, for her basic needs, as Isis points out. But this added arrangement that he gives her the 10% per the, uh, you know, per the 100 month, that's a, a one-time thing. But he doesn't give it to her at once, lest she use it up all at once. He gives it to her, you know, on a daily basis. In terms of call Yem suppose he distributes it, splits it up. Maybe Shabbos Rishoyna. That only happens during the first week. But once the first week is up, so there isn't much left, so you can just give it to her all at once. I call Shabbos for Shabbos, or perhaps, you know, he splits it per week. Maybe it's a weekly allocation. In Tzalema called Shabbos v'Shabbos, you can say it's a weekly allocation, maybe that only takes place during the first month, but after which there isn't much left over, so maybe just gives her the rest at once. Oikel Chaydesh v'Chaydesh, or no, is it a monthly allocation? In Tzalema called Chaydesh v'Chaydesh, perhaps it's a monthly allocation. Shana v'Shana, perhaps that only takes place during the first year. Oikel Shana v'Shana, or it just continues. It's an ongoing perpetual arrangement per month, as long as it lasts. Take it, we let it stand. Amar Av Yud, Amar we know Ragdimon was this wealthy fellow we, uh, we haven't mentioned throughout Chas, and his daughter was about to marry. Oh, sorry, sorry, Rashi says her husband passed away. She was an Almona, and she needed to be taken care of. And the Chachamim committed the following to her for her needs. The Opaisik that she can take from the, you know, her husband's assets, such and such. Arba meyos zuvim lekupa shall be summoned by Four hundred zuz for cosmetic, cosmetics uh, expenses for one day. It was a one day. Uh, this is one day allocation. Every day she needed this amount. Amr lehem she tells them she gave a bracha. Hashem should help. You should have an abundance of bracha. Kach tifsukul ibnei seichem. Likewise, you should commit to your own daughters. And they responded with a resounding Amen. Amen, can you We should always have bracha v'atzloch. Ask Taisus, so why yesterday did they ignore her bracha? She was a Shemeres Yavam. Right? What happened was her husband passed away without children. And the, uh, you know, the Chachamim sat down to uh, provide for her needs. And she gave them a bracha. You should also have this much to give to your kids. And they ignore her bracha. Right? So the answer is, because over there, she was a, a, a Shemir Rasyam. Her husband passed away. And uh, the Chacham did not want that same situation to uh, happen to their kids. But over here, Tesis learns, lift in the Rashi, Tesis learns that over here her husband was around. Her husband was alive, but he was just making this sort of arrangement through the Chachamim to provide for his wife's needs. So in this case, they could afford the Amin. Rashi, however, learns differently. He learns that here, her husband passed away. So the question intensifies. Here, they answer the Amin. And over there, not. Says the Shittim Kibetzis. Apparently, it was a different marriage here. Her first time around, perhaps that's the case over there, it was her first time around. She, uh, had no kids from her husband. She was a Yavama. She was a waiting Yibam. They did not want, did not want to wish that on, upon their own kids. They didn't answer the Yami. But over here, her husband passed away naturally. She, it was a regular uh, Misa. There was nothing abnormal about it. It wasn't a Yibam situation. So in this case, it's Derech Eilam. People pass away, perhaps of old age. So in this case, they answered the Yami. They should have Bracha if their own uh, daughter encounters such a situation. Tanar Rabban. So on the topic of uh, the daughter of uh, Nagdim and Ben-Gurion, Ma'ase Rabbi Yechem ben a story involving Rabbi Yechem Ben-Zakeh, she yeroichem al He was riding on a donkey by Yetzim Yishalayim, leaving Yishalayim. Vo'yot Talmidav, Ma'alch Nachrov. He was being followed by his students. 
Ra, suddenly he notices Riva Achas, a young woman. She was picking out barley from within the waist. The Arabs' animals. That's how poor and destitute she was. As soon as she sees Rabbi Yechem and Zakai, she was embarrassed. This Atva Basara, she wraps her face in her hair. Some learned this was a, perhaps a wig, a shaitel. So she's concealing her face lest he recognize her as being the daughter of this great wealthy man and suddenly is destitute and poor. Varmadalafana, she stands before him. Armala, she tells him, Rebbe, Parnasani, feed me. I'm going hungry. Armala, she tells her, Biti, my daughter Basmiat. Um, Basmiat. Well, who's, who's, uh, whose daughter are you? Armala, she tells him, Bas Nagdiman bin Gurinani. I'm the uh, daughter of this famous uh, wealthy Baal Tzedaka, Nagdiman bin Gurin. Armala, Shabbi Echan was astounded. He tells her, Biti, my daughter, Mamin shall base avich. Hey, Chan Holach, where did your father's wealth go? What happened to all that money? Amr um, she tells him, look, Rabbi, like a isn't it as such maslin, misla, that people present as a mashal, Yerushalayim? In Yerushalayim, there is a saying which goes as follows. Melach mamayim. If you take your mamayim, your wealth, your money, and you salt it, you want to preserve it, you want to keep it, Malach Mamun, how do you do that? Chesser. By deducting. By allocating of your money to tzedakah, to poor people. That ensures your wealth's sustainability. Right? The uh, well known Mishnah Pirkei Abba says, Syag Laisha. Masras Syag Laisha. Want to protect your wealth? Give master, give stock. Right? Okay. Chesed. There's another version of this phrase. If you want to preserve your money, Chesed. Do kindness, give, provide, be generous. So apparently, my father did not, not do enough tzedakah, and there went the uh, the money. Okay. He continues and asks her, Shall base chamich hechen? What happened to your? in-law's money, what happened to the money that your father, that your husband had uh, brought into the marriage, what happened to all that? Amr Lai, she tells him, look, Bazah, my father's money, which I brought into the marriage, that dowry, that came along, that got mixed into my father, my husband's money, and it just, uh, it, uh, <laughs> it infected it. Right? If this money was, was not uh, money meant to be, uh, meant to last, so it affected everything, and everything got infected and lost. Amr Lai, she tells him, uh, Further, Rebbe, Zachar Atta, do you recall? You were involved, you signed my Ksuba by my marriage. Do you remember what was going on there? Armala and the Talmudim. So Rebbe turns to Talmudim and he says, Wow, this throws me back memory lane. This is wow, this is amazing. Zachar Ani, I remember Kishachasamti. Al Ksubasa, when I signed the Ksuba Shalzu of this Isha, I remember, as today, Vaisi Kairaba. And I remember reading Elef, Alofim, Dinre, Zav, Besavia, all that fortune, all that money coming from her father's home as a dowry. Chutz, and this was on top of Michelle Chamil, the money that her husband brought in from hers, for his family. Wow. And look how far she's come. Look how far she's gone. Bacha, Rabbi Yechem and Zaka, he started crying. But Omar, he said, Ashrechem Yisrael, fortunate are you, members of the Jewish nation. Hashem looks after you. Hashem keeps us in, in line. This man shows in return shall makam the cholesterol conforms. We're on track. We do Hashem's will. Ain kol uma velasha. No nation, no culture, can come and rule over us. She let us behem. But conversely, this man shein ois in return shall makam. We're not behaving. Moisron biad uma shevel Hashem hands over his nation into the hands of a lowly nation, Arabs, lowly nation. Not even in their hands, in the hands of their animals. Look what she's doing. She's picking from the waist of the animals of the Umashfel of the Arabs. Asks the Gemara. Nakdiman ben Gurin, he was a well known philanthropist. He wasn't doing Tzdaka. Listen to this price. The following was said about Nakdiman. When you leave his home on the way to the Besa Medrash, it was a whole ceremony. 
claim melas. They would be matziah. They would, you know, plaster the, the, the street beneath him. They would roll out the red carpet. Claim melas. High quality wool material was carpeted beneath him as he was walking. Uboinanim and poor people would come along, follow him. Umekaplan oisan machram. They would fold it away. They would take it away as he was passing by. He was a great balzer duck. What do you mean? He didn't. Uh, he wasn't generous with his wealth. So why? Uh, why did he lose all that wealth? Two answers. One way to answer is He had his own honor in mind. It wasn't done properly. It did not merit the, um, the proper effect which happens when a person does tzedakah properly. Another terrorist. True, he was very generous and giving, but he should have done more. What was expected of him, he didn't do. A man of that great fortune, great, great wealth, he should have given way more. As people say, the load, the shikhana is in proportion to the ability of the camel. Sure, he gave a lot and it was impressive, but really he could have given way more. Tanya. Omar Blazer of Tzaddik, Arab and Echama. It's a Lushan, like a Lushan Shvua. I promise, I, I should not be Zeicha to see the comforting of Kali Yisrael. I should not be Zeicha to see the salvation. If not, Im Loy, you're just making a point to prove that it actually happened. I should experience, you know, bad. Im Loy Reyesia. If not, if it were not true that I actually saw this woman, the same woman that we mentioned before, Meaning, I did see her as follows. She was picking barley. It was in the town of Akko, and she was picking from you know the, the hooves of the horses. And I applied on her this pasuk. Look how far, look how low Klai Yisrael has to, has to land when we don't conform. Pasuk Shir Shiram is warning Klal Yisrael, the Yaffa amongst the Nashim, Tzilach Ikvi Atzayin. You'll have to go to the Ikvi Atzayin, to the hooves of the of the animals of Reiyas Kedui Sayich and pasture your goats. And we dash in Al Tikri Kedui Sayich instead of goats, El Gvi Sayich. Your own bodies, your own sustenance will come from where? From picking the hooves of the animals. That's what happened here. So Klal Yisrael can go very low. When they're low, they're low. But when we're high, we're very high. So, what do we learn today? The standard Masi Yudayim goes to the husband. The extra Masi Yudayim, which was earned easily, husband. Earned through effort and exertion. Tanakama says husband. Rabbi Kiva says herself. Likewise, the Metziah would have the same idea. What defines exertion? We left it as an unknown question. Why does the husband get some of the boishas payments? Because ishtake gufay, he's suffering as well. Cash income gets a 50% markup, whereas appraised items gets a 20% downgrade because they would inflate the appraisal. We discussed the kupa shel besamim that the husband has to provide, which is prorated based on her dowry amount. We concluded with the story of the daughter of Nagdim and Gurion. And the lesson that we learned from the story was when we are Isa Ritzen Shalmokim, we are way above, on top of the world. Hopefully we'll get back there soon. Mary Menu Amin. All the best and Atzlachorab.